you and Ada Sam, and then if it asks you for a time, do it at like 4.30, and if it doesn't let you do 4.30, here it says like 5, do it then, see if you can start streaming early. Okay, listen, man. Okay, so I am live, per se. Why don't you jump on and see if you see me? But there's nobody in here. Okay, there we are, man. Now we're good. Hey, hey, what's up? What's up, Eric? Hang on one second. Hey, everybody. Hey, so you know, um, Penn State got canceled today as of this afternoon because we have a, loads of snow coming down and ice and so on and so forth. And so we uh, decided, hey, let's just do the stream anyway. And because we don't have classes next week, so we will not be streaming next week. Um, and I'm going to be in the Philippines. And so... Let's just jump on and answer some questions from the stream. And in particular, for those of you who are watching the stream on a regular basis, maybe you can also just kind of fill us in on some things that we could do to make the experience more uh, interesting and provocative and so on and so forth. So kick out a couple questions. I'm here until we're done, at least for the next um, couple hours. Be really curious for me to know where some of you all are from. And uh, because I don't really get a chance to see that a lot. And I'm ready to respond to any questions in the chat room that you want to go with. So, and so um, I would say it's not historic. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it is. I guess it's the first time in my history. So I guess that makes it historic. One thing I want to know is, um, can you hear me fine? And so on and so forth. And really, I'm quite happy to, um, I want to respond to some questions. So, um, Mushi22, um, I got into sociology in a way by an accident. Um, when I was uh, in my second year, of, third year of college, I, had kind of, I was getting pretty much getting ready to drop out. Um, I was probably one class away from dropping out and uh, because I just wasn't finding it interesting. Um, I was in the library just looking at some magazines and journals and books and I saw this journal on criminology in prisons and people working in prisons and I thought to myself yeah I could really do that that would be very cool and so it's the first time in my life I ever had anything that I was interested in that was at all academic and I um, so immediately called the social work department because it was a social work journal and I that afternoon spoke with somebody and started and I enrolled in social work classes but social work and sociology were in the same department and the first class I actually took was a sociology course and I was absolutely blown away by it and it was a social psychology class and it captured my imagination and that was it I was like on I was on fire and that's how I got into sociology it was really by an accident Um, Moonstrike 999, <laughs> thinking about changing your major. Listen, my only thought on that is um, we're beyond, uh, my only thought on that is follow whatever it is that you're most curious about. Because one of the things I think that, one of the reasons I think a lot of students are attracted to my class is because I'm really passionate. And I'm passionate because I love thinking about the issues that I think about and that I talk about. And it's re life is long. I've been doing this for over 30 years. And I, a lot of people, colleagues and people I know who aren't, who have not followed their path um, are starting to get burned out and even start, they start thinking about retirement and early retirement and so on. And 
I just can't even imagine that. Um, it's just such a, uh, yeah, I can't imagine how that would be. So follow your path, follow your passion, really. Um, money is, is secondary. Listen, uh, Jensen Vu. Yeah, I was hoping there would be a lecture too, but what happened is we got a lot of snow and it just, uh, we had a snow, it just took us, but this is actually better for me anyway, maybe not for you, but for me, because I really feel like I want to get some feedback from you all. Um, to, if I could give something to my younger self, uh, it would be, I would help myself to grasp on to what it is that I'm learning recently. It's really cool being my age now because um, I'm, less cons I'm less fearful. I'm really less concerned. And hang on, let me, f let me figure out how I'm going to say this. Um, I really appreciate every day. And, and I'm less concerned about what I'm going to do and what I'm going to be and successes and failures and trying to figure it all out. It's just, it, yeah, it's so much better as you get older. And the closer I get to, to my last breath, as I really get older, it's gonna get even better. And so the, the advice I would give to my younger self would be, it's really gonna get even better. Don't worry about anything. Um, so Bill DeAngelis, that, <laughs> yeah, that I believe the earth is flat. Uh, yeah, sure, why not? I'm sure, it's flat. <laughs> Good enough. Yeah, I never. <laughs> okay. Um, do I think more educational establishments should teach sociology? Um, no, not necessarily sociology. I just think that more educational establishments would be a really good idea if we taught students, if we allowed students to think more creatively on their own. And we really don't do that anywhere. And it's hard to do that. And so we, we, we focus far too much on memorization, and all these kinds of things. Um, listen, in terms of the hijab and the burqa, uh, I, it's hard for me to imagine a situation in which the burqa would be really positive, but I don't know, I, as opposed to the, to the hijab, because I did that one class, I'll do it again, actually, in a couple of weeks. Um, I can't imagine a situation in which the burqa would be positive. However, I've talked to a lot, encountered many women who wear the niqab and, you know, full facial covering and so on, and like, who are pretty feminist in their orientation. So I, I don't know. I don't have, I can't have an opinion on it, but it, it's hard for me to imagine a situation. Um, okay, listen, man, from Kashmir, uh, could you tell me how to decide what you really want to do and stick with it without getting bored. Look, here's my thinking on that. Again, it's hard to not get bored. Oh man, hang on. Hang on. It's not about getting bored with what you do. People get bored with their lives. Not about what they're doing with their lives. People lose touch with being alive and that's why they get bored and um we make compromises we do things maybe that we don't want to do we don't understand how long life is we really don't grasp onto it and so there's a lot of very interesting research that shows that people can't think more than about five years in the future and that when people imagine their lives in the future like when we're planning things out that we're actually thinking, we imagine us in the future just as we are right now. Like we cannot imagine in being in the future, ex being living in the future, thinking and experiencing in the future radically different than how we do it today. So that to me is profoundly humbling, I will say. Um, and I just think that people lose, they, they can't really grasp that and then they don't stay alive and then something inside just kind of dies. So, um, I will say that I, this might be a lame answer. Mm. Listen, uh, so, uh, Mawish, here's the thing. Um, if you're interested in other cultures, focus on 
just do whatever you do with other culture. It doesn't matter what your job is. Like my job doesn't tell me to engage other cultures. I do it because I can't not. I just can't. Like some of you on the stream in other parts of the world, I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm just dying. I just want to meet people, including in my own culture. So it just doesn't, it's not about the job. It's about a way of living. It's about seeing someone on the street and then sitting down and talking to them or in a restaurant or anywhere it is. It's just about engaging them. So um, listen, my stance on affirmative action really fast. Um, will I do a public seminar? Yeah, anywhere I could do it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in the Philippines next week, actually doing a talk in Manila uh, for a conference. But uh, I guess my classes are kind of public seminars. Okay, hang on. My stance on affirmative action. Listen, I want to say this. Um, affirmative action is doing some, is taking, giving someone some kind of benefit that they only receive because they're, they're a member of some kind of group. And so there's, there's almost no other way to, to change, to break down inequality, right? To change unequal structures. So we can't, we're, you got to do something affirmatively. Like you have to give some people certain benefits or else the rich stay, the, those with the benefits will keep the benefits and those without will lose them. That's just how it is. And so affirmative action is, is, is a way to start to do that. So, um, Hey, listen, what, Hey, I'm really curious about the, the person who just posted that you're originally from South Korea and you now live in Paris. How is it, how is it in, what's the Korean, how is it being Korean and, and living in Paris? I'm just kind of curious about that. Um, interesting Ted talks to watch. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if you, so, so hum. Did you watch my video on Iraq? You probably did, right? I, I like that in my TED talk, but I don't watch a lot of TED talks because I think I'm just so busy. Oh, there are a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I don't watch many anymore because I don't have time. But, um, how does one find their true calling? Uh, listen, I can only know how I tr found my true calling and I went toward my passion and not toward fear. I did not pursue money. I did not pursue power. I didn't, I didn't pursue things. Um, I pursued the, what was most interesting to me. And in that pursuit, I find my passion. I found my passion. That's all I can say. And my experience of the world um, is that that's the only way that people find their passion. I've never seen anybody find their passion other than, in a way, other than just pursuing the things that they love. Um, you know, um, the, yeah, oh yeah, let me find another question. The most difficult things for teenagers nowadays is um, definitely the sense of being really engaged in social media and not being able to understand that people put their best foot forward on social media. So it seems like everybody's doing really, really well and everybody's really happy and every, and all of that. And that's just not um, the case. Uh, Mariam, I don't follow a religion per se. I'm really comfortable in any religion and uh, I'm comfortable anywhere. I could be, I can be in a Buddhist, a monastery, which I've spent time in. I can be in a Christian church. I can be in a synagogue. I can be in a, in a uh, mosque and I can be in a, in an indigenous environment and feel really comfortable and connected to the creator. So, hey, greetings, Yara. <laughs> Good luck on your test tomorrow compared to sociology test. Give me one thing, give me one thing that you're studying and I'll give you my piece. Jordan Peterson. Um, yeah, I, I think he's, he's really, he's a really insightful person. And I think that he's actually a person who's 
just speaking from his innate organic understanding of the world. And he's not really trying to be something other than what he is. And I think he's really authentic. And when I listen to him, there are a lot of things, you know, I, I read his book um, and the book about the 12 lessons. And, you know, there are things in there that I, I, they don't, they don't really click with me, but what clicks with me is his sense of that he's really, really um, authentic. By the way, exposure is the key and the seed to everything. It's all about exposure and it is just, um, and do I, Jennifer Garcia, do I think what I did was racially insensitive? No, no, because look, it's, first off, sometimes you have to be in the room to see some of the things that are happening. You have to feel it, right? You have to really feel the students and there's a, a sense of trust. Like there really is a lot of trust. And I never have people in the room feeling that um, things are insensitive. I mean, once in a great while, but rarely. Um, um, uh, we, we probably won't. I generally, I don't talk much about religion in the class. So atheism, agnosticism, I probably could, but, uh, listen, man, the needy peanut, Caitlin, Chris, the neat, what advice do I have in terms of relationships? Yeah, here it is. Don't settle. Don't settle. Like, don't hold your standards really, really high. Um, hold your standards really high and don't settle. Do not. Um, Pablo, I don't hold office hours anymore. If students have to talk to me, I just talk to them whenever I can. Um, what social norm would I like to see diminished in the next 50 years? Oh my gosh. Uh, that's a really hard question. I have to think about that. My mind doesn't think that fast. Um, I think that white nations if they don't dramatically restrict immigration, their, their cultural heritage will start to blend into other nations. But that has happened in other nations. We're gonna be the same, we're gonna see it in Korea, in, in, in East Asia, we're gonna see it in being in subcontinent, we're seeing it in places in Africa and in Latin America. I mean, it's just what we're gonna see. And it's not inherently, but that's the, the future of the world is a blending of cultures. That's just the reality. So um, there's no need to really hang on to it, hang, try to hang on to it at all. Um, hey, Nasima, how are you? Nice to see. Um, I will reply to your email. It's just I've been really, really busy. I'm going to do it on the plane ride over to the Philippines. So I will get back to you. Um, well, yeah, OK. Uh, environmental factors and gender identities and sexuality. The, look, I, here's the way, here's what we think about. This goes from the class the other day about being born in a certain way. Um, it's like, I, look, when I was, when I was young, when I was really young and I first had those, those feelings about who I was attracted to, one of the things was, um, I just had a natural inclination or attraction to girls, even when I was really, really young. And I know I have friends, male friends who are gay, who had just at the same age that I was being attracted to girls, they were being attracted to boys and they couldn't stop it. They couldn't help it. They tried to convince themselves, but we know when we have it. And so um, it's just deep inside of us. And that's what I think is biological. Um, um, hang on. Uh, I, I definitely think that my methodology is applicable to STEM courses. I, it can be a little harder, but if you, but STEM is, it's, there's so much fascinating things. There's so many things happening in the STEM world. So yes, it can be. Um, and, wow, man, that's a fascinating question about the Jewish community around the world. I don't know. I don't know how, what I would say to that. Um, okay, about treatment of Asians and other minorities. You know, it's that's it's changing. But one thing that people don't realize is that a Asians, youth, for example, are bullied more than any other group in the United States. And so there's just like this really sense of uh, this sense that 
Asians are so much second class citizens here in the US. It's fascinating, but that's going to change. Um, um, hey, thanks for that comment about, about Korea and, and Paris. I'm really curious about that. Mm. Listen, affirmative action should be based on, it should always include economics. It's like, you know, you take some really wealthy black man and he gets some benefit ahead of somebody else that he doesn't need but he's really wealthy and so all good affirmative action kind of programs include race include class as well as race mm. oh man michael great question about the biological perspective of uh, preservation of a subspecies of creatures yeah i don't know <laughs> i don't know um, the reason I don't have kids is because um, I just never could get to it. I was just so excited about living and just about engaging. And I found, I don't know, it's just, I, it's just not where my passion went. And then once I started teaching and my passion started coming out in teaching and I was meeting lots of people, I didn't, I just couldn't quite bring myself to having kids. And then when Lori and I met, we, I didn't want to, have children come in between us in a way and that because they do right that's just kind of what happens um coke by the way for cuba libres and so we just decided not to have kids and also Lori has epilepsy and about the time that we were going to start having kids she started um having lots of seizures um listen you d yes the, the news that you can trust i mean here's the thing right News institutions are also power institutions, but let's not get rid of all of it, right? I know reporters who work for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. These are professional, thoughtful, really smart people, and they are not lying to us. This whole idea of fake news is just insanity, right? These are amazingly smart, careful people trying to do um, the right thing. Um, I am... So hang on, someone just asked, why am I biased? I'm biased because I can only hold so many ideas at any one time. I cannot, I cannot, um, I, I just can't hold it all. Yes, Asians don't speak out about bullying mostly because it's, it's just like this way of being. It's part of like East Asian culture to, to just be responsible, take care of yourself and take care of your own needs. And so this you know, um, all right, man, hang on, let me get it. Uh, yeah, the, now I know. So you can't believe Asians are the most bullied. I know. Um, it's crazy, right? N not only the most bullied, but, but the most bullied by far. So, I mean, it depends on where you're at, you know, but certainly here in the United States. <sighs> um, Mm. Oh man, whoa. All right, hang on. I gotta slow. Hey, Jeff. I, okay, I gotta slow it down. All right, hold on. Hey, um, if more people dated outside their ethnicity, the world would be a totally different place, honestly. And of course, that's where we're going. So there's not, if we can sustain, if we can get past climate change and all the things that are about to happen, um, yeah. Okay, the amount of pressure children in it to school and pressuring children, it's just insanity. This is why, for example, in my class, I don't require students to take notes. I don't demand that they remember anything that's happening in class. And sometimes if you're on the stream, you're watching, everybody's on their phone. They're, you know, they're like this. Though. Because A, many people are on Twitter and they're talking to each other. Um, or, and... Or B, they're just maybe engaging something. I don't know. But people listen. They, they listen. They come out. But lots of people are following the Twitter feed. And other people are following the chat on the web stream. So sometimes it seems like people aren't paying attention. But the way I teach is to just give people the greatest amount of, of uh, opportunity to do. Hey, listen. Um, the per per person from Mogadishu in Somalia. Hey, if you're a university student, contact me. Because it might be, we might, at World in Conversation, we might have some interest in having some dialogues with a Somali university. So, 
Um, Jeff, I figured out how to slow it down. Um, yeah, okay, Barack Obama. Yeah, exactly. Barack Obama's half white and half black and half African, African American. And so it's just interesting. It sort of goes by this thing that, you know, we still live in this world where minority status is the most important one. So, you know, he's identified as a black man because he has darker skin. So immediately he's black, but he's half white. And so we don't talk about that. Okay, here, uh, what I do in Colombia this past summer, um, we have a project, a dialogue project in Colombia. So we um, are helping to get it off the ground. It's called Colombia Se Escucha, to get it off the ground in Bogota. And then we also have Colombians who we train facilitators in Colombia and then Colombians talk to Penn State students. So that's what I was doing. Um, yeah, let me find another one. <laughs> listen, stay, stay, listen, it's okay to be 30 and living at home, it's all right. Well, it depends on what culture you're in, but in some cultures it might be mandatory, but you know, it's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen, man. Um, Sh Shiloh Gar Garka. I, it's, I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah. This thing with ethnicity and race, like biology and culture, um, people don't understand that Hispanic or Latino is a cultural category, not a biological category. So it's, it's, people get lost on that. And unfortunately, we often refer, use that as a racial category. So we'll say like, okay, what's your background? White, European, Black, African, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Native American, et cetera. But Hispanic, Latino doesn't fit with all the other ones because Hispanics or Latinos are people who ancestors come from lots of areas of the world it's a cultural category and we just are always missing that um an asian american who has a blurred sense of identity well here's what i would say right who doesn't feel either i would say stop seeing it as a blurred sense of identity stop seeing it as actually a really fascinating interesting identity so if you're asian or you're latino or you're black or white or whatever it is but you're like are trying to find this place where you fit um it's not, it's not, I would start by saying, hang on, it's not blurred. It's not any, you know, it's your own unique place. And then find out where you, I, yeah, I would just not use the word blurred, actually. See it actually, as actually kind of a clear thing. You know, most people anyway want to be unique, so be unique. Um, listen, which race is it, is it does the best with women? Here's a really interesting thing, right? In the United States, quite a number of years ago, not too long ago, I read a study that um, when we ask in researching married men, heterosexual men, and, and their actual activities in the house and the way they relate to women and children and like doing housework, black men, specifically African-American men, were the men that by far and away were most likely to do the dishes, clean the house, do housework, um, take that those jobs away from women, or at least not not expect that women should do those jobs. Hey, um, uh, Atar, my take on the hijab is that it's actually kind of, it's like in that one video. Um, I can imagine being a woman and feeling really comfortable in a hijab and just kind of this sense of not wanting to be seen as a, just as an object by men in particular, and by so complete opposite of it being some sort of, sort of oppressive thing, it would be a liberating experience for me. So that's my take on it. I don't think that's true for, for everybody. Some people, that a lot of Muslim women will say, well, it was my choice. It's like, oh, okay, it's, it's not your choice entirely, right? If you grew up in, in a culture that wasn't Muslim, you know, you wouldn't choose to wear a hijab. So it's, it's coming out of culture, but, um, but still it's, uh, I have tried in Jira. In fact, 
Uh, I was in Ethiopia two times a year before last, in Addis Ababa two times a year before last. And not only that, um, but Ethiopian, I always had the idea, okay, this is a really personal thing. When I was a young um, person, when I was in college, when I was an undergrad student, I had a mentor who was from Lebanon. And uh, he and I used to have a joke that we were gonna run off to Ethiopia and find our wives. And uh, because we thought Ethiopians were the most beautiful people in the world. And, and it didn't have to it'd be a wife. I Maybe mean, we found men. It wouldn't matter who we found because Ethiopian men are the most handsome in the world. So that's when I also fell in love with Niger. Um, yeah, so Yara Ali Musa. Yeah, exactly. Like, wow, Kurdish and Spanish. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hey, Suga, I'm just talking. I'm just answering questions as much as I can on the live stream because we didn't have class today and we, because we had a snow day. So I thought I would just do this and hear different things that maybe respond directly to some questions. Um, Non-European Western immigrants are cultural cuckolds. I'm not sure what that means when, what, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rashab. Okay. Oh, why not dress like women, a woman one day? Yeah, I could do that, actually. That would be cool. Listen, man, Rafi, here's the thing. Lost and recent graduate, here's your career advice. <laughs> just, fo just follow the thing that most just inspires you. That's it. I'm telling you, um, just follow the inspiration, my friend. That's all I can say. Yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah. Um, how do I deal with conservative radicals like Michael and Bill? Who's Michael and Bill? Jeff, you can tell me that. Is that someone I should know? Um, being the most scientifically rich country. Listen, man, okay. Uh, what's, what is the sociological drive behind the US being one of the most scientifically rich countries yet with more than 25% of the people believing in few of the most unreasonable ideas that we can possibly be produced? Look, it, we, we, there is a lot of, uh, the United States is a, is a mystery. That's all. That's all. Like if you're from the outside and you're not here, we people have this idea that the U.S. is really rich and like the U. The Americans are really rich and that Americans are really advanced. But there's a lot of poverty in the United States, an immense amount of poverty in the United States. Poverty, unlike we see in so many places in the world, so many places in the world. Honestly, I read a recent U.N. report that it's something like five percent of Americans are living in deprivation akin to certain areas of places like Haiti and Bangladesh, okay? Um, also, Americans are really narrow. Many Americans are just immensely narrow in how they see the world. So they're behind in, in terms of education, they're behind in so many different ways. So, um, listen, man, um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm super open-minded, but I would say uh, that I try, I try to take on as many possible perspectives as I can. Um, look, we could have affirmative action based on just economics. In the end, that's where ultimately we, we probably should go. Affirmative action based on just economics and leave everything out. Um, I... I don't get nervous talking in front of 800 people. I get nervous actually talking in front of a very small number of people. So 12 people will make me nervous. 800 people is not a problem. Um, so ironically, I don't know why that is. I'm actually really shy, believe it or not. So the, like the other night, I was at a dinner with some students who weren't my students. Um, and with, with Lori, my wife, and Lori did 90% of the talking. I just kind of want to sit in the corner and be quiet and not be seen 
It's really an odd thing. Um, listen, Eritrean and Ethiopians, basically, if we do DNA analysis, you're essentially the same people. So just want to say that. Um, so it's, it's the, the divide is very much cultural and political, but biologically, you're the same people. That's why I always have fun with Eritreans and Ethiopians. Um, just always telling them, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all good. Hey, Bill Thompson, definitely it's okay to be white. It's cool to be white. Like, the, the, I have a problem with white people who feel like they have to reject their whiteness. It's all, it, I mean, Europe has a fascinating history. Okay, so Europe has done some really horrible things in other places, but other places have done some horrible things in other in, in as well. So it's like, ah, this sort of denial or this fear of being white or talking about being white, it's, it's, a, it's just a problem. So, um, yeah, exactly, man. Just like LeBron James in a, in, a ter in, a, in a poorly done affirmative action program, LeBron James' son could also get like financial assistance for college or something like that. It doesn't happen very much, but it could. Um, listen, man, um, news is bad and tragic because look, me, this is meow meow one. Here's the deal. If it's news, it's because it's rare. The only things that show up on news are things that are rare. If it's not rare, if, if it's something that happens all the time, it's not going to be news because it happens all the time. So plane crashes and murders and homicides and robberies and all these things are rare. And so they are the news. And then ironically, we turn around and we think that those things are happening all the time. No, they're being reported on because they don't hardly ever happen. And so the best way to be to not be cynical is to not is to remember that that all the negative stuff that I'm seeing is actually stuff that doesn't happen very much. Um, yeah, Nimishmala, yes, exactly. You have to make a lot of eye contact. And that's, I'm actually kind of shy. I don't, I'm not good at making eye contact because I kind of have, um, I'm kind of shy in that way. That's just what it is. Um, Listen, race, ethnicity, nationality, race is like, is a really a biological construct, right? So it's, it's related to our physical characteristics. Ethnicity is our culture, like culture, meaning like the patterns, the different ways in which we engage, how we dress, how we speak, how we, you know, our music, our, our food, all that stuff. Nationality is the nation states, which are, which bind some cultures and some cultures exist in two different nations. And sometimes there are many cultures within one nation, like in India, for example. Um, listen, my take on Brexit, fascinating. I was listening to the, um, starting about four in the morning, my radio was going and I woke up and I was listening to all the debates in the parliament today. It's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not gonna voice, I, I, I been following a lot. In fact, interestingly enough, I was in um, Brussels. We were in Brussels on the very day that the vote came in, the Brexit vote came in. So we went down to the EU and it was like a ghost town. And then we were just in Northern Ireland when things were being like hashed out in Ireland. So um, listen, Turkey isn't regarded. It's regarded to be in both e Europe and India. So it's like, yeah, the Bosphorus, right? And so on the one side of the Bosphorus is the European side and the other side is the Asian side. And when you get in a boat, as I've done, and I will do actually in a few weeks because I'll be there, you get in the boat and you go from the European side to the Asian side, it has a very different feel to it. Um, what's my race, by the way? I, I'm mostly, it's not race, but my ancestry is mostly um, English and Irish and Northern European. And I have like one, according to my DNA admixture, I have about like 1.8% Sub-Saharan African, which means somewhere back in time. And I have some, um, ancestry from the, from the Iberian Peninsula. So either Spain or Portugal, but I don't know really what that means. Ironically enough, I don't spend a lot of time to thinking about my own ethnicity, which is really bizarre that I, but um, I actually was just in Ireland and I started seeing a bunch of people who looked like me. And I thought, I think I might really have to dig into this ancestry more. So um, 
I was going to, so I'm going to do that probably. Okay. Um, listen, uh, actually, hang on, uh, Lauren Kelly, so white people, inventing your cell phone, modern medicine, saves world time and time and time again. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yes, we did, but we, not necessarily, like we did, but Look, Silicon Valley is a global community. All of these, all of the stuff that you're seeing coming out, coming out of Silicon Valley, is, it's dependent on people from all over the world who are bringing their knowledge together. So it's not just white people in that way. And uh, it's really, a, it's the, the new, this tech revolution that we're seeing is a global revolution. So um, I want to see that. Um, Listen, Turkey has never been regarded as Europe. I know it. It mostly is not, but um, but some people build the connection there, right? So it of the European flavor is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about it really being Europe, but it's really a uh, the European flavor. But yeah, historically speaking, it is it is it's not Europe, but. But when does Europe end and when does it start? You know, when does Asia, where does Asia start? Where's, what's the Middle East? You know, you know what I mean? So lots of people just sort of talk about stuff. Um, um, hang on. I don't, I, I know, I wouldn't say that Trump is trying to push foreigners out of this country. I would say that Trump is acting in this very nationalistic way, which has the impact of um, pushing people out. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so CL, you said, I don't think one nation can be the most beautiful group of people, you, you know, in the world, like Ethiopians and I, okay, listen, go to Ethiopia, that's all. That's all I gotta say. Go, go find, go to the Ethiopian community. If you're in the U.S., go down to Washington D.C. I, I don't. I know it's a okay. I, I, I'm teasing, right? But uh, yeah, I don't think any. There's no physical characteristic that, truly speaking, is more beautiful than another. Beauty is a 100% social construction. Um, listen, the language I want to learn and master. Well, I speak Spanish. And I can't, I, you know, I can do lectures in Spanish. I mean, I can do that, but I need to get better at Spanish. I've been speaking it for 30 years and I still need to get better. So it's terrible because I've lived for many years in Spanish speaking countries. So. Um, I don't, I, uh, okay. Okay. Do Andrew Rye, I've been to Ethiopia. They are beautiful. Thank you, man. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, um, by Petertron, okay, what inspires me to do what I do? It's I can't not do it. I can't stop thinking. I can't stop putting different things together in strange and odd and quirky ways. And so I just keep doing that. And, and I somehow I've been given the opportunity or I created the opportunity to have this big room where I can do it. And now because of Jeff, um, and his predecessor were, were really able to do it on the live stream. And then I travel and it's like, oh my gosh, I just, I'm inspired. I'm inspired to meet people and hear, hear from people and just know all the awesome things that are happening in the world. Um, the Uyghur people, you, I think Uyghur, I don't know how to pronounce that, but this is from Attila Attila. Uh, what do I think about the Uyghur and their current situation? It's it's terrible, and it's it, it's really immensely problematic, troubling, and very disturbing, actually. And um, yeah, it's this is the the Chinese government is really out of one hundred percent out of line, out of control. So. Um, Okay, so hang on, Marco Permulus. What if my egalitarian fantasies are in I don't, I don't think I like have you get. I don't think the world. I don't, I don't have an egalitarian fantasy. I don't think people are equal. I don't think people can be equal. Human individuals are unequal, and some groups 
some practices of some groups, some cultural ways of being of some groups are better adaptable to certain situations. So for example, in the world today, um, there are some cultures that are really just more inclined to support and promote um, a lot of free time and a lot of really reflection and self-reflection, just the growth in that kind of inner way. That's not adaptable in the world. So that's not the same as a culture that's really driven to, to act outwardly. And so those are not equal. They're very different. And so the one is not going to do very well in the world. And that's just it. And the world doesn't need to change for the culture that wants to promote inner reflection and thoughtfulness and that kind of thing. It's just not. And so I don't think it should either because that's just not how things are. So I don't have an egalitarian fantasy. I just don't think that, I don't think it's all about equality. Here's what I have. The only thing, Michael, that I am really insistent upon is that, and I, and this is what I speak to, is when people think that everybody has an equal chance of making it and that all countries and cultures of the world can do what they want to do if they work hard enough and so on, without acknowledging that people who have, for whatever reason, made it or moved it, have advanced, whether it's their own actions or just chance, right? That when the, those people who think that, that, that they don't see that the people who make it ahead, who move out ahead, don't put obstacles. They don't see the ways in which they put obstacles up for other people to follow in their paths. And that just pisses me off. And so if you acknowledge that, like if somebody says, look, yeah, you know, rich people in this situation, they got rich and then they put all these barriers up to other people getting rich because they had the power to do it. And that's just what they did. It's like, and that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. If you, if you see that and acknowledge it, and then want to say, hey, that's okay. That's the okay thing to do. I'm fine. I don't care. But you got to acknowledge that. And once we do acknowledge it, then I'm good to go. I don't think, you know. So anyway, I hope I responded. Um, yeah, Robert Putnam study. Yeah. Um, well, here's the thing, right? Um, I think people, I think... Um, People are happier when their environment, this is about Putnam's study and bullying alone, the idea that, um, so if you didn't see that comment, scroll to it. People are happier when their world, when their world is known, when there, are, there aren't a lot of things up in the air that are unknown and that could change radically in any one moment. And so when we live in a heterogeneous environment, especially one with lots of different classes and groups and things that are changing pretty um, extremely, people get unnerved and unhappy. And so, yeah. So, but that doesn't mean that we go to cultural homogeneity. It just I means that's just the conclusion that is true. I think. Um, um, all right. What else? Yeah. Hey, listen, that 20, 247,000 figure that comes from Freakonomics. Actually, they, they posted it. These guys uh, did a piece on in Freakonomics on that. It's really fascinating. Uh, what are my credentials? Um, I have three degrees in sociology. I have my BA, my MA, and my PhD in sociology, but that doesn't really mean anything because anybody, you know, you can get a degree and not learn anything. So my biggest credential, I suppose, has been that I've been teaching for 34 years, meaning I've been talking out loud in front of other people and really encouraging them to tell me when I'm wrong and to argue with me and force me into to force me to think about things in different ways. So um, I would say that. Uh, the functions of a government. Oh man, that's an awesome question. You know, look, so here's the thing, right? A government human. Okay. Here's a thought. I don't ever get to say this in class. Hold, hold off. Um, when human beings live in a collective environment, then there are things that have to get done that they can only do collectively. So for example, we have this major snow and ice storm this hour. I'm looking out my window and we've got, you know, six inches of snow, we're getting ice. Um, we need to collectively pool our money in order to get rid of the snow. Some, we can't, all, we can't just, 
have every person who lives in my whole neighborhood just get their shovel out and go out and shovel the streets and then go out and shovel the highways and so on. That doesn't work that way. And it will never work that way. And so what we do is we pool our money we give a certain amount of money to this pool and we call it it's taxation and tax dollars. And then somebody else pays someone to go do the jobs that we can't do as individuals, but we can only do collectively. And so that's the purpose of a government. Um, hey, thoughts on Peterson. I like Jordan Peterson, by the way. I think he's cool. Um, that's okay. Did you get the government thing? So taxes, you have to pay taxes. And if you're not paying taxes, if you don't have a government, you're, you're going to have a government. So it's either, A, I'm going to pay taxes, and I'm going to have this government do these jobs for me that I, that we, that I can't do, me and the, the other people around me can't do, or I'm going to pay a corporation to do it. But the corporation is the same as paying taxes. It's no different. Sociologically speaking, it's the exact same things. Um, hey, so Fatima. Uh, in Pakistan, I was actually planning to come to Lahore, Pakistan in December, but I'm not, I, I wasn't able to do that. I'm going to, I really want to try to come to give some lectures, but we are going to Iraq actually to see Basam. Oh. Recommended reading for someone considering a career in teaching sociology. Uh, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I guess the, the, the thing would be to try to, I wouldn't read very much. I would read, here's what I would do. I would read certain small things and then try to explain it to somebody else and essentially be a sociology teacher before you are a sociology teacher, because, um, that'll help you to understand what it is, you know, and don't know. Um, yeah, snow's coming to Pittsburgh. I think so. Hey, so uh, Emmy, Emmy, so from Mongolia. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Uh, do I have a favorite speech or monologue? No, I, I don't really, I don't think. Yeah, my favorite, listen, uh, here it is. Uh, my favorite, the person who probably has shaped my thinking more than, to be open-minded more than anybody else is a, is a scholar named Joseph Campbell. And he wrote this. There's this three-part book, The Power of Myth. And you can buy the book. You can get it online. You can, it's a, he's a comparative mythologist and just studies cultures and religions and mythology um, and from a comparative place. And at the end of his life, he did these series of, um, these series of talks. And it was a six-part interview series with this guy named Bill Moyers. And it, so it was his lifetime of wisdom. And he's probably the person who has shaped my thinking more than any other single person to be open, except my wife. Um, you know. So Chinese studying in Spain. Hey, where are you? So CZ, where are you studying in Spain? Um, <laughs> Jordan Peterson minus his kinks. Yeah. Uh, okay, hang on one second. War baby. Oh my God, man. War babies and babies born out of sex tourism. Um, ah, man. It's just, I, I don't know where to start on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, Caitlin Christ, uh, social sciences, what can you do with them in a, as a, in a career? Everything, anything, because it's not about Madrid, my first love, by the way. Uh, it's not about specific things. It's about, yeah, you follow your passion. Like you don't get a job. You don't, you don't follow the job. You follow your passion. So I have former sociology students who are like, ministers and priests and stockbrokers and accountants and lawyers and house painters and electricians and farmers and just whatever they do so many different things um favorite country i've ever visited is probably the most intriguing is is japan by far and away 
uh, just absolutely blew my mind. But I love the Middle East. I have to say, I love the, the Arab Middle East. There's something about it. I've been to, to Qatar many, many times and the, the Emirates, Kuwait. Uh, there's just something about the culture that I love. I don't know what it is. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, hey, Harvey, how are you? Uh, nice to see you. So here's a guy, Harvey Cheng, by the way. So this is what I mean, right? So Harvey sent me an email. So he's on, he just jumped on the live stream. Um, Chinese American, uh, living in New Jersey, sent me an email, had some questions. He and I Skyped last weekend. And here's this guy, like this young guy, right? Who just blew my mind with ideas right here. And I have all these notes that I took. So like Harvey had maybe had this idea that like, oh, well, it was really cool to talk to him. And me, I got four pages of notes uh, of just different really cool ideas. And that's the thing that it just never, it doesn't matter. I, I learn something from everybody. It's so awesome. Um, so hang on, from Portugal, do you think religion can be inclusive for someone or maybe Telsa increase it? Yeah, listen. Uh, it can be, religion can be divisive and it can be inclusive. It can be both, really, honestly. It just depends on how you look at it. So religion is an outward expression of what should, what is identified as an inner experience. So we all have our own inner spiritual experience of the world, of like trying to answer the questions, where do we come from, what are we doing here, and where are we going? Those are the three, per, three perennial questions that... If, you're, if we're not asking those questions, we're not alive. That is just essential to life itself. Where do we come from? I never, I ask that question every day, multiple times. What am I doing here? What's my purpose? What's the reality? I never, I have never stopped asking that question in 35 years. Actually, since I was 12 years old and I smoked my first joint of marijuana is when I first asked that question, to be honest with you, right? So that was 40 seven, 46 years ago. And I will ask it until the day I die. And my spiritual life is, is finding different, an understanding of things around me, nature, other people, thoughts, philosophies, ideas, to help answer those questions. That's my spiritual life. Some of those questions are also being asked by people who have organized them into religions like Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and so on. And sometimes there are rituals. All of those religions have rituals and the rituals exist to point us inward, to point us toward an answer to those questions. So if you go to a Catholic mass or if you are praying in a mosque or do your prayers, it doesn't have to be in a mosque. The idea is that that ritual those actions give you the time and the space you need to turn inward to find answers to those perennial questions. But sometimes people think that the religions are actually the answers and the religions point us toward the answers. And so it's fine if you believe that religions are the answers. I don't. I believe that they can point us in that direction. And I actually want the answers. I don't want the religions. So, um, so anyway, do I still smoke? Uh, well, yeah. I try, not very often, by the way. How about that? Uh, because the goal, the goal is to not, to not rely on external factors and forces for an inner journey. Right, so that's the goal. Um, hey, have I ever thought of preparing a lecture about Russia and Russians? Um, yeah, actually, we were in St. Petersburg last fall, Lori and I, and we did a series of lectures in St. Petersburg, and uh, it was awesome, really awesome. It was so cool to find. To and by the way, Russians are. I found them. So I've tried. I I haven't traveled everywhere in the world. I've been to probably forty countries, but and some countries many, many times, and I've lived for long periods of time in many countries, but I found Russians to be among the nicest, friendliest human beings I've ever met. 
go completely goes against the stereotype that Americans have. So that was pretty cool. That was awesome, actually. Um, my religion is secular nihilism. Hmm. Not, not, well, I don't know. Maybe, I guess you could call it that. I don't like words like that. I don't use words. Um, thoughts on psychedelics. Uh, I think people abuse psychedelics because they don't understand them. And I think they're not meant to be used just to sort of like play around them. So I actually had a conversation uh, with someone earlier today, as a matter of fact, where I was encouraging him to address an issue that he had that might best be addressed through a shaman. And uh, from my understanding of what his issue was and shamans and so on, and my, my experience with shamans. And so that would include psychedelics, by the way. So, um, so uh, Pompeii, uh, I don't know how to say it. You find religion to be a tool, a way to be okay with uncertainty in this world for us humans. Uh, it's a powerful tool. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tool. It's an outlook. Maybe, maybe I'm not going to be arrogant and think that I know, but maybe there is a creator and the creator created, gave human beings these religious ideas. So they wrote them down and maybe there are multiple gods, maybe, you know, in, in the, in, in the Hindu world, multiple millions of gods. I don't know, honestly. And maybe there are UFOs out there. And who knows, they came and delivered, the, there are other beings from other planets that delivered these things. I don't really know. But as a sociologist, and what I've experienced is that it appears to me, and my reading of the early spread of ideas, of religious ideas, in particular Christianity, of which I've read many, many books about the early origin of Christianity, because it's just like a hobby of mine, it just appears to me that um, these are sociological creations. And so... It may not be, but that appears to me. Um, yeah. Um, dude, so Michael Pamulis. So you, I'm going to, affirmative action is simply white racial masochism. Uh, for some white people it is. Like, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's just guilt. It's like, yeah, we're going to do this little program. We're going to hand these little crumbs out to people and we'll feel better about ourselves. Um, yeah, but, um, I actually here, let me also, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stay with you for a second, Michael. I don't, I just don't, what we see, we don't see that racial minorities are, I just don't see them going after white people in that way. I, I don't see it. We, we never see it. We, I've never seen, I don't know of a single example in the world. Uh, no, okay, okay, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. I don't know. Okay, hang on. Um, interesting talk about myth. Uh, into, so Lola... Interesting that you should talk about myths, the most reflective pieces of history, even if they are not real. They are so important to understand history. Yes, it totally makes sense. Read Joseph Campbell. Honestly, just read that book. Don't try to read his book like Hero with a Thousand Faces or whatever. It's just it's too dense. It's a series, the, the power of myth. It's short. It's their interviews. They're really, it's an interview with Bill Moyers. He's, it's really, except accessible. You can get it on Netflix. You can find it on YouTube and watch the actual interviews. It's six hour long um, conversations. Uh, just mind blowing in his ability to say. Um, so uh, Karen K. personally you believe the creation of the universe is so unique that the human brain simply can't process it. It's always, yeah, I, I'm there on that. Look, it's like uh you, you, how could, first off, we don't know, like, there's no way to know, right? People, if you believe there is absolutely no God and there is, it's all about evolution. Well, what started the spark, right? What is that? And whatever started the spark is, could be just what people call God. Um, it's too cosmic. It's too amazing. You know, there could be, 
it's just I'm looking at my window at this universe. There could be so many universes, multiple layered over, layered over, just to waste our time thinking we know, as opposed to just sitting back and just being in the mystery. <laughs> just be in the mystery. So, um, what do I think about conspiracy theory? Uh, look, mostly I, I don't have to. There are. If you take a lot of conspiracy theories and you actually take the time to look, to dig at what people are saying, like we didn't actually land on the moon and so on and so forth, right? What happens is you can build a really good story looking backward. So yeah, I can build a great story that we never actually landed on the moon. That's just a big myth. And I can, and I can look backward and pick out all of the pieces that can make a great story about why and how we never landed on the moon. But I also could then go back at how somebody, when somebody else does that and really start digging in and saying, wait a minute, hang on, where'd you get that piece of information? Like in 911, there's this story that somebody found. One of the reasons, of course, we know this is kind of insane is because, you know, we found uh, one of the hijackers' passports on the streets of New York or something like that. I don't know. I mean, there are all sorts of things. Anyway, I find when I start digging into conspiracy theories that there are a lot of the questions that just people just a lot of the statements or truths that everyone just keeps holding, holding on to like it is it a statement of truth, but nobody actually can go back and find the origin of that, like whatever that is. And so the 911 stuff or 911 is a is a great example. There are so many theories that, OK, this didn't really happen. This was a government plot and so on and so forth. But. No one, people don't go back to the original source to say, wait a minute, hang on, where'd you get that idea that this, this, that, or the other thing happened? Mostly, I don't think we need conspiracy theories because anything you can imagine that would be a conspiracy is pretty evident out in the world. You know, you don't have to. Anyway, but some things that identify as conspiracy theories, I think I would follow them, yes. I hope, man, that's really hard to explain, but... Uh, I'm not the most honest person out there, by the way, but what I am is a person who honestly, I, I'm really trying to get at the truth. I really am. And sometimes, so, you know, Michael, you might stroke, struggle with this or some other people might feel that I'm, I'm not being honest and truthful. It's just, I don't have time to dig into all of my explanations. Like I really am. Uh, a, a registered libertarian voter, which is in the United States, a really would be identified as a really conservative person who re firmly believes that we should, the government should be as small as possible and that individuals should be responsible for their own actions and that sort of thing. And I do that. I stay, I, I read that literature and I stay there and I think in that way because sociology is the opposite way. And so I need the two to balance themselves out so that I can find the truth in the middle. <sighs> okay. Um, let me see. Mm. Uh, Rifat, don't neglect your dissertation. Man. <laughs> Just get, get back to it. It's all good. You get, we get in that place that when writing a dissertation because it's often our first major work where we sort of hit that wall and we get a low and we just feel like, oh my God, we're never, we're never going to get through it. Just keep going. You know? um, just keep going. You'll, you'll, you'll get it done. Mm. Do I support Brexit? Uh, Brexit? Look, I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to have an opinion. I did not support Brexit when it happened. I mean, I just thought this re really the biggest reason is because it, it it emerged out of fear and because the people who were pouring money into Brexit were not being honest about what it's going to mean for the UK to separate itself from the EU. Really, um, it, they're not going to be honest. And so that's what it is. And so in that sense, I don't support it. Um, but I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. Um, Nasima, uh, I, I will respond to your email. I really appreciate, uh, what you wrote and I will, uh, you know, okay, let me see. Let me get another, uh, <laughs> let 
can we get another? <sighs> Racism. Um, yeah. It's not always about hate. Sometimes it's about hate. Sometimes, more often than not, racism is just built into the un, to the structures of a society that, you know, like, for example, um, right now, in the most recent elections in the United States, um, the, the, the Republicans were trying to keep black and brown people were pa passing all these really fascinating rules and laws and procedures to keep black and brown people from voting. And that's just the reality. Because Why? Because black and brown people are more likely to vote Democrat. But that doesn't mean that the Republicans who were passing all of this legislation were racist against black and brown. They wanted to win their election. So they're like, well, we, we don't, we're not necessarily sure we, you know, we're going to do the same thing for working class white people. Well, no, that's not true. But we know that if black and brown people are more likely to vote for Democrats, then we just got to find our way to, to keep them from voting. And so that's not inherently racist in a direct way, but in an indirect way, it's racism, right? But it's not that they are racist in their thinking. It, it is that they want to win. And so it's a game. So I'm going to play this game. And so that, I think, is where a lot of people kind of miss some things. Um, uh, the title of my course, by the way, is Race and Ethnic Relations in the United States. That's the official title, but that's not the, the working title. I don't, that's not how I, I work it. Um, I prefer both spiritual faith and rational belief, both. The spiritual faith is, it's just the thing that, it's what gets me through every day and I just the, the deep meaning in my life. But rationality is what I use to navigate many, many things. No, actually, I use them both equally. Okay, never mind. Uh, the intellect of Asians and Europeans, which would get the higher weight. Uh, I don't No, I think you. it's just two different ways of approach, two different cultures first off many europeans many asians but there's a there's a sort of a dominant way of being in the world that would be asian and a dominant way of being in the world that would be european meaning that most people tend to walk through the world with a certain way of being and both have their their strengths and both have their weaknesses so one is not better than than the other um, um I don't think democracy is failing because the turnout rate is so low. I think democracy is failing. First off, there is no such thing as democracy as an, as something, right? Things, a system can be more democratic or less democratic. Demos, democracy is based on demos, which is of the people. And so that means that people participate in decision-making and people participate in electing who is part of the government and who will be in the next government, meaning who will represent them in some way, whether it's a fascist leader or a representative body. And so that the people can never 100% participate because it's like, I would have to walk around with a cell phone all day long, just voting on things. I mean, it's just not possible. So the pure democracy is not a thing that exists, but rather something that you strive for. So it can exist more or it can exist less, meaning people can have more power or people could have less power. And so, or less abilities or less opportunities. And so I actually don't think it's failing because people are voting less. I think it's actually failing because because it's a business and the business is such that the, the political parties are just making so much money in this most recent election. It was like, you know, $20 billion is like what was spent by all the political campaigns and political parties and so on, all the advertisements, all, all the things, it's just a business. And so they're just, the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States, as an example, are just hanging on to all the power in the business and people make a lot of money off of it. Um, listen, man, Jordan Peterson, what's his, what are my thoughts about his views on gender and sex, equality, and free speech? 
um, mostly I, I, he's totally on with free speech. Like, come on, man. The, you know, universities curtailing free speech and so on and so forth, right? But his one on gender, the only thing I'm going to say, and this goes from the class we had two days ago, uh, he has this thing about this, um, you know, they, they're, they're only really two genders, like male and female, right? And, I'm, and my thing is like, and he thinks it's absurd to think otherwise. And I'm just like, why does it matter? Like, who cares? Why does it matter? I don't think it's absurd, right? So that's the only thing that I could disagree. Um, yeah, definitely. Russians can be both Europeans and Asians, for sure. There are, what, seven or nine time zones in Russia? I love my time in Ecuador, by the way. Um, I, yeah, it's where I, in some ways, it's where I came of age. So it's, I, I did spent a lot of time there in my 20s. Um, I think heterosexuality is the norm because most, the vast majority of people throughout history are heterosexual. That's just the given. But the people throughout history have also been homosexual. And mostly we see lots of homosexuality in even today in communities uh, or in countries that pretend that it's not there. M young men are going to have sex for sure. And young men are going to have sex. If they can't have sex with women, they're going to have sex with other young men. That's just a given because that's just part of this drive. And so I can give you lots of examples of just young men in certain countries where they don't have, they can't engage women at a young age, like say here in the United States, having sex with other men. It's just normative and we don't talk about it. So I'm not even going to name the countries, but, um, but yes, um, you know, it's the thing about Peterson that's cool is that he's his own unique thinker. So, all right. Um, what else? Uh, yeah. And you know, you know, look, man, you, you, the thing about sexual reproduction is you, you don't need a lot. You just need to, to, for two people to have sex once. You know, for a woman to have sex, a man to have sex with a woman once every nine months or so to have a child. In between all that time, people are going to be having sex. And we see homosexuality everywhere we look in the animal kingdom. We just see it everywhere. Yes, and some, uh, yeah, absolutely you can come to class. There are always seats available. So definitely come to class. Um, so we see lots of homosexuality. We see bisexuality. We see animals pretending to like male seagulls, there's a species of male seagulls. The male pretends to be female so that it can just hang out with females. Like it ruffles its feathers in a certain way just so it can kind of hang out with female seagulls. And that's it. It doesn't try to have sex with them. It just wants to hang out with them. That's like cross-dressing, you know, or yeah. And that's not, maybe it's just being in drag. I don't know, but whatever it is. Um, Hey, I don't think taking pride in your own race is, the, is really necessarily a silly idea. I mean, it is maybe, but it's not taking pride. It's just like, it's maybe it's like, like, for example, I don't take pride in white people, but I think there are like, like, a lot of like really cool things that white people have done, like white culture, or European culture, or the U.S. culture, that it's like, it's awesome. You know what I mean? Um, that it's cool. Like, for example, in, in, in one of the keys in, uh, about Americans, there's this thing that Americans just want to get things done. They just get things done, man, that we think that we can do it. So it's a problem. For example, we're going to let climate change spiral and because we're in the end, we're going to think, OK, well, we'll take care of this and we'll fix it. Right. But it might spiral so far that we won't be able to fix it. But the cool thing is Americans have this unique way of just being able to say, yeah, we're going to, we can just take care of it. We'll get it done. And okay. It's, other cultures have that too, but there's something unique about the way that Americans hold that. And so I don't know. Um, all right. So hang on. What else do we have? Yeah. So white guys going gay in prison and then being straight again. Look, here's what a prisoner once told me, um, who spent many, many years in prison. Um, he said, listen, I was in a prison when we were having this conversation. So this is about the idea that people, if people need to be, to have homosexual sex, 
they will. If it's their only option, they will. Most people will. And what he said was, look, we, we might be all men in here, but we have feelings too. And we want intimacy and we need intimacy. And we just kind of want to, we want to have that closeness and the touch and like, and so, so they do. And not everybody, but it's not at all uncommon um, because that's how human beings are. We're going to reach out. And so, um, listen, okay. Yeah. Come to Syria. I would love to come to Syria. Oh my gosh. And I wish only the best. Please for Syria. Yeah. Okay. Um, does thought require language? That's actually a really cool Noam Chomsky question. I know. Okay. He, he's, he's like this hardcore left political rhetorician and thinker. But before that, he actually was a brilliant um, uh, thinker on language and thought. So, okay, hang on. Yes, it's the individual, not an entire race, that achieves great things. But look, it's not like it's the race. Not, let's let's get away from races because like I don't think that the white race. It's not like the white race does any. The white race, whatever that is, is composed of so many different subcultural groups. But there are subcultural groups that sometimes achieve that achieve great things or that have these characteristics that are really fascinating. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just cool. So uh, I'm just, the point is I'm I just don't rule that out. You know, I, I really don't. I just keep everything's on the table. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, hey, you know what about BTS? So what's really interesting is last week, so this is from Suga Kuki <laughs> with T or Tay, I don't know. So I did an interview with a, a reporter from Bloomberg in Seoul, in Seoul, South Korea. And she was um, with BTS in Japan this past weekend when all the shit blew up on them. And so I responded to all her questions and she said, what question do you have for BTS? And because she was going to be meeting with them and interviewing them. And I said, my question is, can, would they Skype into my class? Because I'd really love to have at least one or two of them Skype into the class. But before that could happen, everything blew up because one of the BTS members, this is a, a Korean, a K-pop band that's really popular right now. One of them, they, somebody got a picture of him wearing a this t-shirt that's fairly popular in, in some countries that shows the a bomb blowing up over Japan as though it was a good thing, like the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs and all hell broke loose. So, um, so anyway, yeah, they won't be Skyping into my class. Um, okay, hang on. Um, okay. Uh, what what else, man? Um, wait, hang on. Uh, Michael Permulis, that idea that more than half of Black Americans have an IQ less than ninety—that's not true. That's that's absolutely not true. Okay. Um, so I just want to say that uh, I'm I it can't I, I know I can't be true. It it, it doesn't matter even if what why is ninety the cutoff? But that's not true. That I know. Um, K-pop is degenerate to... Okay, hang on. Um, it, is, it, is, it is okay to not get attracted to Asian men, but please know that your beauty standard is, the, is only the only standard in the world. Um, no, I think that if you're... So, so this, this has come... To Matt, uh, if you're responding to me, yeah, I don't, I, the, the whole point of the, the classes on beauty standards is that there are multiple beauty standards. And one is there's no particular feature that's more beautiful than another. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. Uh, the opinion about the current China-US relationship. 
Um, I think the China U.S. relationship is in the end. I don't, I don't see a major war breaking out. If the war could be economic, but it won't be anything else. Well, I am. I say that. I'm not entirely convinced that things will not spiral out of control. So it's 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 a bit um, unnerving, actually. The, the I'm not. I. I think that the current U.S. administration, uh, there are a lot of people in the administration that really don't, uh, are, are not well versed on what's going on and how to do diplomacy. I will say that. So um, it's, kind of, it's a little bit unnerving to me. <clears throat> so Did I ever do any research on black inventors? No, no, not per se, but I know lots of really awesome things were invented by black people, but here's what I will say. In terms of invention, um, we know that creativity is really at its best. Creativity is really sparking at the margins. And so this is why we see music, new musical genres are generally not created or clothing genres or language or foods or whatever it is generally emerge from groups that are culturally marginalized because when you're in the middle when you're in the center of something right like here you are in the center that this is i got this in germany actually it's a beer thing i'll put it like that okay so if you're if you're living in the center here then you're gonna the, the, all of culture is directed toward you and so you're going to stay stuck in the center. But if you live on the margins of that culture, whatever it is, you don't have that, the same access to what's going on in the center. And so, you know, you're going to have to create new ways of, of being in the world, new cultural forms, new foods, new, new clothing styles, new all sorts of things. And so, you know, this is what we see. Right. And so I don't even remember what I was responding to, but oh, I'm black inventors. And so therefore we see many inventions happening um, with people on the margins. I'll, I'll just give you an example. So you can go to Haiti and, you know, my screen is broken here on my cell phone on the corner. I can go to Haiti. First off, I can take this to an official Apple dealer in my town and, they'll, and I can pay $50 or $80 and they'll fix it. And they have special tools and special knowledge and a special understanding. And they got to have these special tools because that's what you really need. But I can go to a street in Haiti where these kids have lined up on the road and they're sitting on tires and they're not, they don't have shoes. They're wearing a sh shirt and, a, and shorts and they're eight and nine years old and 10 years old. And they can have these tools that I don't even know what the tools are, but they're not official Apple tools. And I can give them my cell phone and I can give them $5 and they will put a new screen on it. And I'm like, how the hell did you figure out how to put a new screen on that phone? First off, how to open it, how to get it, and then how to fix it. Not just put a new screen on, but also how to fix it. Like, where'd you figure that out? And necessity is often the mother of invention. And so people will figure stuff out who are marginalized. And so I've seen Haitians who made solar light panels. I'm like, how'd you figure out how to make a solar light panel? But they got basic ideas somewhere and then they put it together and they, it's a necessity. And so the marginal people often do just do really, uh, I, that's where it happens. So you want to be on the margins. Um, uh, okay, hang on. What do you... Wait, why did you ask what your ideal skin is a month then during class and then make? I well, I think I, this is to D, D, double D, double D, double D squared. So I think that I think I'm trying to get people in their minds to think things like, OK, what is it that you identify? What is it that is ideal? What it you know, what it what do you? I want them to have something in their minds, and then I come in and try to undermine that. So not so that they can take my idea, but so they can really start to think on their own. Um, so I will say that. That's always my point, by the way. Um, yeah, I, I like that the class has a lot of diversity also. So this is somewhat, again, because, um, because that's what's fascinating to me. You know, it's just, I love it. I love talking to people and 
I love hearing from people in class, meeting people. I meet the most interesting people from, you know, not just in other countries, but also here in the United States. Um, thoughts on China's credit score system? Whoa. Uh, I don't have a thought on that. I guess I gotta look that up. Um, okay, saying, so hang on, hang on. Let me find another one. Um, okay. Do I think education should be subsidized? Yeah, subsidized, but not free. I don't think it should be free. I think you you got to pay something, and you got to like you got to work toward it. You, when things are free, you don't. This is a basic libertarian idea, by the way. When things are free, you don't. Um, you don't. You know, we don't pay. We don't value them in the same way. So you got to pay something for education. What I would say though is, after you get out of secondary school. You, you, in my, if I were king of the world, everybody would be forced to take a couple days off. Um, and yeah, yeah, you'd be forced to take a couple, a couple of years off. Pardon me, I get distracted there. And uh, you have to just have some time to figure some things out for yourself and then come back to school. Uh, hey, Listen, I'm Danish. Can you tell me what Scandinavian face features are? I have no idea. Listen, I don't, I don't, here, here's what I will say about that. When I travel, say like through Europe, um, I don't know, I don't ever know what they are and you don't know what they are when you're living there. But if you go to Poland or if you go to Ireland or if you go to Greece, and uh or if you go to germany when you go there you know you're not in scandinavia and so when you go to ireland you know you're not in scandinavia and but if you live in ireland and you're used to seeing irish faces these white faces and then you go to scandinavia to sweden or you go to germany or you go to you know uh western russia you know you're not in ireland so i don't necessarily know I, I, could, I can identify certain things that are Scandinavian, like a slightly wider forehead, but um, yeah, it, but it's awesome to, to know, to see that. Um, listen, my religion, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a particular religion that I follow, but I really enjoy, I, I enjoy pieces of all the different religions. Yeah. <sighs> Um, okay, mom. I don't think healthcare should be free either. I think that, look, here's the thing. Um, this is where, this is where my libertarian side and my sociology side come together. I just don't think it's really a good idea for people to be walking around drinking 64 ounce Cokes and soft drinks. I, it, I, it's a bad idea. All the sugar we eat, it just, it's a not, it's a bad idea. I'm not going to be the one that tells people you can't drink 60, you know, two or three, six, you know, liter bottles of soda, even though it's really bad for your health. I don't want to be the person that tells someone they can't do that. And yet people who do that through their lives are going to, their bodies are going to break down earlier than they should. And then you, you have to rely on a healthcare system, right? So what if the healthcare system is free? It's like, wait, hang on a minute. I don't want to pay for that. That's like shit behavior. I don't want to pay for it. And so give us, take responsibility for your life and like eat healthy and be healthy. But yet I can't be the person that's telling people exactly how to do that and start drawing, making the rules for how you have to be healthy because it's a slippery slope. Pretty it's, I start with soda and then suddenly it's candy and then suddenly it's fatty food. And then I, and then before I know it, we have to ban falafels that are, that are, uh, cooked in Greece. And so I, so yes, healthcare should not be free either. Um, hey, I'm glad you saw the TED talk about uh, sociology. I like that. Yeah, I don't drink much soda either, but once in a while I have a Cuba Libre and once in a while I just want to. Um... Yeah, listen, so do I disagree with how 
uh, school and healthcare is in Norway. No, look, here's the deal. That's my inherent orientation is people have, people should pay something. So yes, I disagree in the sense that I feel like you got to pay something, right? However, in Norway, um, it's a small country. And because it's a small, largely heterogeneous country, I mean, there's immigration waves, but mostly it's heterogeneous. And mostly the culture, there's a cultural way of being in Norway that uh, you all can make it happen in a fairly realistic and responsible way. So it kind of works in Norway, right? But it won't work in a place like the United States or France or a different kind of country that's not as heterogeneous. So... I will say that. Um, yeah. How was your experience? Uh, I, lo I, I love Rutgers. Um, I had a great experience at Rutgers. It's where I met my wife. So obviously I love Rutgers. And yeah, I would always come back to Rutgers for a guest lecture. Yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, BBC United, you mean homogeneous, not hetero. I'm not sure. I might have spoken. I might have misspoken. But what I meant to say was Norway is largely homogeneous. And so you all can make certain things happen that we, like, couldn't hear. Um, yeah. Yeah, God loves diversity and difference and all his creatures. Yeah, I, I mean, if there's a God... Obviously, God must really appreciate um, diversity. So, yeah, hang on one second. Why do you want me to? Just um, hang on one second. Everybody. long time it's late yeah i know okay um listen um listen homogeneity is not better they change happens creativity happens because new ideas come together like you can't sit in a room and i cannot sit in a room with no books and no information and just think my think lots of new ideas event i can do it for a while but eventually i'm going to stop having ideas like i can't i i need external input and so if i sit in a room with people and we all think the same the same thing is going to happen the creativity happens when we bring new ideas together and we bring this idea with this idea and one over here and they come together and now we've created something so um nothing we did not put people on the moon or whatever, anything that we're doing because we because everybody in the room thought the same way. Um, yeah. So listen, man, the '90s kid, you're right. It it does work. Yeah, but you you're having this immigration happen, and you know it's first off what you got to remember in Scandinavia. You you have to remember this about immigration. Nobody wants to just give up their culture. It's really hard to give up your culture. Like when I am traveling somewhere and spending time, some, especially if I spend a long period of time, like I can't, I don't have time to learn the, first off, if I'm traveling somewhere, I don't have time to learn the language. And sometimes I don't even have time to learn the customs. Like, do I tip or do I not tip? What do I say to the taxi driver? Like, how do we do that? And so when I go somewhere, when, if I were to move somewhere, there are certain customs that I have that I want to hang on to. And there's certain ways of being that I just am. It's just part of my culture. And so um, I can't, nobody could expect me to give all of those up. It's just not what it is. And, and certainly at my age, I'm not going to learn Russian or I'm not going to learn Arabic or I'm not going to learn um, Swedish. Like, I'm just not. I can try. I can give it my best thoughts, but I'm just, it's going to be really hard for me. And so um, I'm going to want to hang out. I'm going to want to hang out with Swedes. And I, I probably, more than most people, I'm going to integrate pretty well into Swedish culture or Norwegian culture. But uh, 
nobody could expect me to do it 100%. It's just not going to happen. And if Norwegians or Swedes or Finns came to the United States, they're also going to seek out other Norwegians and Swedes and so on, right? So it's just how it is. That's how human beings are. And so what you what we have to remember that when people integrate, that it's, it's not going to happen seamlessly and that people are going to have to need some time and people are going to have to be allowed to have their own communities. And then with that in mind, then we work to bring the communities together. It just is. So... No, hang on. This is today. Uh, you'll fight because whatever you say, I can't believe how bored your students look in lecture. Um, actually, I was saying this earlier. So we people follow the Twitter feed on their phones and they follow the, the chat on the live stream. Right. And so you see a lot of students. Um, on their phones, like look at watching me and then on their phones because they're following other stuff. I tell my students, I want them to have their phones out in the classroom. So it keeps them from talking to each other. You know what I mean? And, and it, it gets, I want people to be engaged in a big room like that. It's like, it's really hard. You can't raise your hand and ask questions. So I want them to be just like you all are throwing all these things out there. And now you're starting to talk to each other. So that's how I want my students to be in class. So um, they're not in, some are bored. There's no question about it, but most aren't pretty bored. It's hard to be really bored in that room. But some are, I'm sure. Um, listen, man, uh, Rifat, how do you find your passion? If you're bored too easily, um, how are you bored? Meditate on this. You're going to die, and it might be tomorrow. And... Uh, how are you bored? The world is so utterly, absolutely fascinating. You can get on your phone and you can talk, you can communicate with any, you're right here. You're on this, this chat communicating with people from all over the world, right? Like there's, how do you, how do you be bored? It's, life is the most, go watch a, an insect. Go find a single insect and that's crawling across the ground and just get out on your hands and knees and watch that insect crawl and watch what it does and spend about an hour. If it's a beetle or something, spend about an hour, okay, 10 minutes watching it and the miracle of what's going on. That's what I would say. Right. Um, what else do we have? I'm just gonna answer a couple more questions. We can do this again sometime, honestly. It'd be really lovely. I. I I think it's cool. I'm having a lovely time. No, hang on. Bored equals poor plus ugly. No, that's not. Okay, I wouldn't say it like that, but okay. Um, hang on. Hang on one second again. I'd do it another time. I just can't. Um, I would like to leave your room now, and I can't because I think it's... Okay, hang on. You can. I can turn it off. Hello? Hang on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read... I'm going to look at a, hang on one second, you all. All right, I'm back. Um, okay, I got to put my feet up, and I'm really going to just respond to a couple more um, questions. Anybody can go into my classroom, by the way. It doesn't really matter. There are always chairs there. There are a lot of seats in the front. You'll see there are people who sit along the back wall because they get there a little late and they don't want to come down and sit in the front. So if you're at Penn State and you want to come in the classroom, you, you can. Um, state government versus federal government. Oh, so awesome. Man. Yeah, even if you don't go to Penn State, you can always come. Um, Get students to express the easiest way to get students to express their opinion. Here it is. You ready? Um, be authentically curious about what they have to say. I mean, not like, hey, I want to hear what you have to say so I can show that you're wrong or something. It's like, no, I actually, I want to be, I'm going to be a, a three year old child right now. And I really, really, really want to know what you have to say. And then when you tell me, I'm going to be a three-year-old child again. I'm going to say, how did you get to that? Why? What do you mean? Just like how a three-year-old just keep asking why, 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 why? Well, why is that? Well, I don't know, because the sky is blue. Well, why is it blue? 
And well, because it was, it's always been like that. Well, why has it always been like that? And that's in the easiest way to, to get students to engage is to really be authentically curious about what it is they think. Um, so anyway, that's what I think. Um, D, D, D and D, D, you asked, do you agree with what Jordan Peterson is saying? Jordan Peterson says a million things. Some things I agree with, some things I, I probably would agree with if I understood what he was saying. Like this idea, like he has this idea about like non-binary genders. Like he thinks that whole thing is just silly. Like you're male or you're female, right? But if I sit down with him, I don't think that. I'm a sociologist. So like I just see this as a fluid process, right? Um, if I sit down with him and talk to him, I would understand why he says that. And then I'm certain that he would understand why I say what I say. And we would agree. And we would we would just see that we're actually accounting for different things. Um, I am concerned about students who are going into massive debt. Um, very few of my students, Penn State only has about 100 sociology majors. And the vast majority of, uh, so, you know, I have very few students in my classroom are sociology majors, and maybe there's like two or three. Um, but yeah, I'm concerned about students who are going into a lot of debt, yeah. especially those that probably could do something else. Mm. Okay, what else do we have? Well, Sweden is over. <laughs> okay, I do have an Instagram. It, I think it's I unlearn. So I U N L E A R M, but I don't use Instagram. So I, you use the SOS 419 Instagram. I think it's, hey, Jeff, if you're still there, can you put the SOS 419 Instagram up? I think it's SOS. I think that's the SOS 419 Instagram there. SOS underscore 119. Uh, yeah, there it is. Man. Okay. Um, France was ruined by immigration. Well, listen, man, here, let me just point something out about France, right? France is also an imperialist country who destroyed, if you want to say France was ruined by immigration, France also ruined other countries and caused a lot of pain and heartache and a lot of destruction. And so France necessarily did what it needed to do, which is open itself up to immigrants from those other countries. And so it did. So like, okay, well, there it is. If France didn't want immigration, France should have been a colonial, should not have been a colonialist power that would have like stopped all that. I don't teach any other courses besides social 119. I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, I just teach, we, t we have a, we teach a lot of uh, students to learn how to facilitate dialogues. So, um, so yeah, where do I think? Okay. Yeah. Low birth rate and social welfare ruin Europe. Well, I don't, look, social welfare was fine in Europe until, you know, like East Asian countries started to realize, uh, started to jump into the capitalist game game and could had just an, an, an endless army, a surplus army of, of laborers, as Karl Marx would say, and can pay those laborers very small amounts of money and, and build an economy very, very quickly. And now suddenly Europe in its social welfare state has to compete with that and it can't. And so therefore, you know, you see the, the GDP of China just taking off and uh, yeah, so that's that Europe you know, it's just the world changes. So it's not that social welfare destroyed Europe. It's just social welfare works within a particular context. And then after, when once that social welfare has to compete with other nations and other systems, it just can't do it. Um, um, and I do not know who Mencius Moldbug is. <laughs> 
the Lou is going to be a giant hookah bar in 2100. All right, well, that's pretty cool, I guess. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, it's in it, Samad. Yeah, it's in the Thomas building. Yeah. Uh, did I vote for Hillary or Trump? I didn't vote for either. It's actually the first time in my life that I didn't vote in a presidential election. Um, and I didn't vote because it was so contentious that I, I felt like I would, that Lord, my wife and I both felt like we needed to not vote so that we could address all of the turmoil that was going to happen. And it was really pretty extensive. So it feels like, um, it feels pretty, I felt good to not vote. Uh, or I, I just felt like I couldn't vote. Adrian, I, by the way, I did not vote for Obama two times. I didn't vote for Obama. I've never voted for a Democrat for president, by the way. So what, what, uh, I didn't vote for Bush either. So what are your views on Trump's shithole nation? Actually, there's a, uh, we have one of our videos out there called shithole nations or shithole countries or something. I don't know. I think I talk a lot about Haiti in it. It was from last year. It's kind of, I thought it was a cool class, but is globalization good or bad? Globalization just is, man. It's not, it's neither good nor bad. It's like, is snow good or bad? Is rain good or bad? Is water? I am not Jewish, by the way. My, I am named Samuel, or in Hebrew, it's Shmuel. I'm named after my mother's gynecologist who is Jewish. His name was Samuel Zucker. And when I was born, my mother, I'm the fifth child. So when, after my mother had, by the time she got to the fifth child, she stopped being that interested in even coming up with a name before I actually showed up. And in the moment, she just decided, hey, I'll name him Samuel after this guy. So that's how I got my name. Yes, my wife is a sociologist. She doesn't have a PhD in sociology, but she is a sociology professor. And she's the one who taught me sociology. I talked about this in one of my TED Talks. Uh, she taught me about the sociological imagination, which is pretty awesome actually. Uh, snow and rain is objectively good. Yeah, I am reading. Someone asked earlier, Max Sun, about the internment camps, um, Muslim internment camps in China. These are the weakers. I'm not sure how you say that in Chinese. I asked someone how to say it in Mandarin the other day, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very disheartening. Uh, um, Okay, so listen, Alex Boris, why American universities make students pay thousands of dollars for the course? Because it's an industry. Listen, it's a business. It's big business. My students don't pay anything for their readings. I put it online for free. But yeah, in Europe, you pay nothing. So yeah, why would we pay? Why would professors do that? Just put it online for free. So anyway. Um, uh, Sam told me he's gay. Wait, hang on. Is that me, Cristobal? You're talking about me? Uh, I am not gay. But if my wife dies, it's it's likely... I, if my wife dies before me anytime soon, I would be with a man before I would be with a woman because I don't want to go through menopause again. <sighs> yeah. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. How about that? <laughs> Jeff, you missed that one. You miss Cristobal there. Um, <laughs> you had to let that one slide through. Yeah, okay, I am gay. Why not? Sure, I'll be gay. I'll make sure I'll tell my wife, though. Um, okay, two more questions. Uh, and then I got to go. I really do. It's been, it's been uh, almost two hours. Listen, here's the deal about democracy, okay? Democracy, participatory democracy is not inherently the best system in the world, okay? It, it isn't. It, 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 it's just like, no, a, a, a really thoughtful, mature, wise body of leaders could absolutely be infinitely more uh um, who, who thoughtfully chose their successors, because you understand that the problem with government is not an acting government, it's the next acting government. So the, the reason we have wars and revolutions and so on isn't because of, is, is almost always not because of what our governments do, it's in the selection of the next government, the successors. That's the problem. 
right? So participatory democracy, if we had a wise group of elders, it could be infinitely better than the, what, what the, this thing we call participatory democracy, which again, remember, it doesn't work. Um, okay. <laughs> um, sorry, Cristobal, I wasn't serious. Is monogamy necessary? Okay, I'm gonna do this one, only because you, you have a Chinese name. And there are, uh, there's one culture, I actually used an article on this in Spain or in China, uh, I think I'm quite sure it's China that is um, matriarchal and that women have multiple partners and men don't and and no monogamy is absolutely not necessary um, I can't imagine having more than one spouse because I would go nuts uh, I, it's hard for me to live with one person so French postmodernists uh, when I was in grad school I used to um, read and that's when the postmodern movement was kicking in gear. Um, but I have to say, I didn't fully understand it. Maybe I needed to smoke more weed. Um, um, Jeff, why, why are you allowing Cristobal to be a troll, man? And Cristobal, like, why do you want to be a fucking troll? You know, like, why would you do that? It's just so stupid, man. Um, no, hang on. Michael, monogamy isn't necessary to raise children. You could raise children in a, have you ever read Brave New World? You could raise children in a factory. Um, you don't need monogamy to do that. You could, the, you know, Mormons uh, who practice polygamy raise a lot of children and they seem to do a pretty good job with it. Um, the Mormons who come to my house and knock on my door and try to convert me to Mormonism to a, are really very thoughtful and kind and nice people. You don't need monogamy. I'm not saying that polygamy is good or monogamy is bad. I'm just saying you don't need it. That's just basic kind of sociology, right? Um, okay, one more. Okay, I'm going to do one more. And Hang on. And then we got to go. We'll do this again, though, because it's, it's fun. We can do it over the break at some point. I'm... Um, uh, okay, hang on. Um, I'm not... Okay, I'm going to go back to Michael here. God, you just like... I, I, see, this is the thing. I like people who are not going to just buy the party line, right? Look, there's no question that monogamy was critical for the rise and the way Europe arose and the way Europe flourished. There's no question about that, okay? Um, that's just a given. It's also no question that other cultures have flourished that have been, uh, maybe didn't build skyscrapers, but have been just profoundly healthy and who are not, are not built on monogamy. So, okay, um, here's the deal, y'all. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I just got to go. I got to like, we, we have to, uh, <laughs> email Durkheim, by the way. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Just tapping as well. So listen, man, uh, next week we don't have class because it's Thanksgiving break and I'm going to be in the Philippines. And then when we come back, we have. Uh, four more classes, and then we take a break, and then we come back. So, thanks for um, thanks for um, thanks for uh, just jumping on. Thanks for watching. I'm I'm blown away by the fact that anybody would eat care, even care to to take the time to disagree. So, um, thanks for that. Thanks for disagreeing for those of you who did, and. And I really, I really appreciate that. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, I gotta go, man. I really, I'm, I'm gonna end the stream. So, thanks, and we will, we'll rock it, and we will be in touch. Okay. Whew. <laughs>